Good to see you guys. It's an honor to have you with us. If this is your first time ever at LifePoint, let me say a special welcome to you. My name is Jeff. I have the privilege of pastoring here at LifePoint, and I look forward to being able to meet you in maybe one of the upcoming weeks. And So be sure to swing on by. I'd love to shake your hand, and maybe it's even at our Fast Pass on Tuesday night. It'd be great to have you guys there. I also want to say a big welcome to our Leland family. Pine Valley, can we make some noise for LifePoint Leland? We've got Leland family, and they meet over the bridge, and uh, we love you guys. It's an honor having you. And, and you know what? It has been amazing to watch over the last month as this church has just activated to serve and meet needs and to touch families and to help people around this community. The last I heard was over 270 projects that our church got to be a part of, and that might have been clearing debris, mucking out a house, tarping a roof, and I just think you guys have been absolutely incredible with that. And I wanna say a big thank you as your pastor Thank you for being a kind of church that I can just brag about because of your heart for people and your heart for the Lord, and that means the world. And, uh, and now here we are, and, and we got friends down in Florida in the panhandle, and they got hammered. I know you've probably looked at the footage, just like I did, of some of these places that have just been decimated. And I want you to know we've got a truck that is being filled with supplies and headed down that way. And it's been, it's been pretty wild to watch churches respond to the opportunities that have been presented. You know, our heart breaks, but at the same time, uh, it takes tragedy oftentimes to bring out the best in humanity. And I believe that's what we're seeing. And I'm seeing that, I'm seeing that all across our church and many other churches. And I wanna say thank you for that. And, and, and I found that, you know, life has a way. I think, you'll, I think you'll agree. Life has a way of taking you places you hadn't planned on going. Anybody, can anybody say an amen to that? Like, it has a way of taking you somewhere that, that you didn't think you were gonna be. Sooner or later, we find ourselves dealing with the reality that life can take you off script. And what I mean by that is we all had this idea of how life was gonna play out, but let's just be real, we're off script. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a little off script. A lot of us are, are not in a place we're not in a place that we thought we were gonna be. And here's the thing, here's the thing, as we're gonna discover, off script isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, it can actually be a great thing depending on whether or not we handle it right. And so for the next three weeks, we're gonna be working through a story in scripture of a guy whose life goes way off script. And so I wanna, um, I wanna ask you to join me as we pray. We're gonna invite God into this time. I believe his presence is here. The Bible says if two or three are gathered, he's in their midst, that when we enter the presence of God, we do it with, with worship and with song and praising, and that's what we've been doing. And right now, I wanna ask God to speak to our hearts and open our minds and challenge us, and I wanna invite you to join me in this. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, for, for, for the way that you love, the way that you provide, the way that you protect, Lord, even when we find ourselves in places that we didn't think we were ever gonna be, we discover the powerful fact that we are still loved, that we are known. And so God, I pray right now amidst this time, Lord, as our hearts are going out to our brothers and our sisters down in the, the panhandle and the surrounding states and the devastation they're dealing with, thank you, God, that we have been blessed to be a blessing. Thank you that we can be a part of making an impact in other people's lives. And God, I pray that today, that as we dive into your word, that we would learn and we would grow and that our lives would look more and more like Jesus because of this time together. And we pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen, amen. I wanna preach a message today that I've titled, Not Alone, Not Alone. If you're taking notes, I wanna encourage you to write that down. You'll find a note card on the seat back in front of you. Or if you're a digital note taker, you can get your LifePoint app out. And on your phone, you're gonna find that LifePoint app and you'll see a place where you can follow all the notes for today. But I want you to track with us and we're gonna park out in the, the book of Genesis. Now, if you've got a Bible, this is probably the easiest book to find. It is the very first one that you're gonna come to in the Old Testament. Genesis 37 is where we're gonna be, so that's your head start. Go ahead and find it on your phones, find it in your Bibles. But here's the thing, off script, off script. It's safe to say that a month ago, most of us did not see ourselves in the place that we are now, agreed? A month ago, none of us were really thinking much about Hurricane Florence, and, and because of Florence, it's taken our community very much off script. And, you know, I think about it, you know, 
I've never, our, our church has never pioneered hurricane relief effort. Raise your hand if you have done something over the past month that you would say, I've never done that before. Just raise your hand. I've never, you know, some is like, I've never run a chainsaw before. I've never tarped a roof before. I've never mucked out a house before. I've never relocated to a shelter before. And what we found is that this has taken us to a place that we didn't think we were gonna be, and in many cases, we didn't even have a plan for. You know, a, a pastor friend of mine called me a couple days before the storm hit, and he said, you guys are about to get punched in the mouth. Are you ready for this? I was like, well, that's real comforting. Didn't help that he was from Florida. He had weathered Hurricane Irma last year, and he began to talk to us about what's it gonna take to get ready. And, and what I found is life has a way of punching you in the mouth sometimes. It's it almost like a sucker punch that you weren't prepared for, causing you to abandon plan A, go to plan B, then you had to abandon plan B, and I don't even know what plan we're on now, but we're getting by, and we're doing what God has called us to do, and we're, we're living in what I would describe as like a, a new normal. You probably heard people reference that. And, and so I believe that some of life's greatest moments happen off script. And I think we're gonna discover that as we go through this passage today. So if you've got your Bibles, Genesis 37. And in Genesis 37, here's what we discover. Check this out. Genesis 37 says this. It says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Now, I don't expect you to know who all of these characters are, and I'm gonna do a little bit of intro as we dive into this series. And so I wanna explain a little bit about the family line, because how many of you know you are where you are in life because of your family, right? And how many of you know families can be a little crazy? If you're sitting beside your family, don't look at them right now. Just kind of, just wink at me, all right? Be like, I know what you're talking about. I'm sitting next to crazy right now. Because every family's crazy, right? If you were sitting with family, just right now, just glance to your left, glance to your right. If they're not crazy, you're the crazy in your family. And it can be that way. So let me just to set a little bit of context about where we are in this family line and why this guy Joseph is a big deal, I wanna to try to explain this to you. So, so to explain the significance of Joseph, I have to back up a few generations, okay? So in the Bible, we've got this guy named Abraham. Now, if you grew up going to church or if you were in a vacation Bible school, you know all about Abraham. His name actually used to be Abram. God changed it to Abraham. He put an H in it. And we know Abraham as Father Abraham. Father Abraham had many what? Sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are, so let's just praise the Lord. There you go. Some of you have no clue what just happened, and that's okay. We had a song that we sang in, in vacation Bible school that was like, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons have Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right arm, Father Abraham. And so you just start doing it. It was like the Christian version of the hokey pokey because before long you're like, Father Abraham had many sons. And so, I don't even know what just happened there. So that's Abraham that we're talking about. So Father Abraham, so Abraham is married to Sarah. Now, crazy part of their story is God tells Abraham to look up at the stars and as numerous as the stars will your descendants be. That's, that's great. Except for the fact that Abraham is in his 90s, so is Sarah and they have zero children. And yet, if God makes you a promise, he will deliver on the promise and they have a son named Isaac. Isaac is son of the promise. So you have Abraham and Isaac and Isaac marries Rebecca. Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca have two boys, Esau and Jacob. Now, it's important to understand Esau and Jacob's role because Esau is the firstborn, Jacob is the second. And so you have Abraham, Isaac, and Esau being the firstborn. Now, why is this important? Many times through the Bible, we will read of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what's interesting is why is it not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? Esau is the firstborn. There was a tremendous significance of the firstborn. So if you were the firstborn son in your family, it meant that you were the one that carried the family line. You were the one that received what's called the birthright blessing. So check this out. If you, if you were the oldest son, when dad passed away, you got twice the inheritance that any other sibling would get. It's a pretty good deal if you're the firstborn. 
yet we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The reason that we don't say Abraham, Isaac, and Esau is because one day, out of stupidity and hunger, Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew, right? It's a terrible, terrible trade. And so because of that, the, the, the birthright blessing falls to Jacob. Now, Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. Let me explain, okay? Jacob falls madly in love with Rachel. And so he approaches Rachel's dad, says, I will give you whatever you want. And so he ends up working seven years to marry Rachel. So he has his wedding day and then has his wedding night, wakes up the next morning and realizes that her dad pulled a switcheroo on him, wakes up the next morning and instead of it being Rachel in the bed, it was Leah. Oops, anybody ever got married? You thought you married one woman, wound up she was someone else. This dude took it to another level. So I'm telling you, Bible's crazy. If you don't read the Bible, it's, it's wild. This is like an episode of the Jerry Springer show <laughs> happening here. So Jacob is married to Leah, and then in order for him to marry Rachel, who really has captured his heart, he now has to work for another seven years, right? I mean, that's love right there. So he has two wives. Time were, times were different. Definitely not an advocate, two wives at all. However, this begins to set the tone for the family that Joseph is growing up in. So let me explain. So Jacob and Leah, they have four boys. I mean, she just starts cranking out. You have Reuben, you have Simeon, you have Levi, you have Judah. Meanwhile, Rachel has yet to conceive and she's beginning to get jealous. Like if, if Leah keeps giving Jacob all of these children, his heart is going to go to her. So Rachel's got this idea. I know what I'll do. I will have Jacob sleep with my servant, Bilhah. I told you it's crazy. So Bilhah is a servant of Rachel, begins to sleep with Jacob, and she has Dan and Naphtali. So she's got two, she's got two boys. And so Leah's like, oh, is that how we're going to play this game? So she says, well, I have a servant named Zilpah. So Jacob, you sleep with Zilpah. And when they do, she, she begins to have Gad and Asher. And so now you've got Leah that's got four, Bilhah's got two, Zilpah's got two, Rachel has yet to conceive any children. Then, through the course of time, Leah has two more boys, Issachar and Zebulun, and then a daughter named Dinah, and everybody knows someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. Someone's in the kitchen, I know, oh, fee fi fiddly oh, it's anyway, it's not where that came from, I just wanted to throw that out there. Then, then, Rachel conceives and gives birth to Joseph, and then Benjamin. And while giving birth to Benjamin, she dies, okay? So I explain all of this to help you understand the family dynamic that's going on. Jacob loves Rachel, but remember what I told you, the firstborn son should be the recipient of the birthright and therefore a double portion of the blessing. Well, the firstborn son is Reuben, but the son that he truly loves is the firstborn to Rachel, which happens to be Joseph. And Joseph is the focus of the journey and the story that we're gonna look at. Now, some of you, this is why you came to church today. This comforts you, because you're like, I thought my family was crazy. And I want you to know all families are crazy, okay? All families are, are dysfunctional. This just happens to be the one that we're gonna be spending a few weeks getting to know. And the, the main character in our studies over the next couple of weeks is this guy, Joseph. But I need you to understand this dynamic because it's gonna play out in the story that we begin to read. So let's go back to the passage in Genesis 37, verse two says, this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph a young man of 17 was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So apparently they're cutting up or they're not doing what they're supposed to. And so Joseph would go back to his dad and say, hate to be the one to break this to you, but those, uh, those brothers of mine, those sons of yours, and he would begin to rat them out for something that they were doing that they shouldn't have been doing. Verse three. Now, Israel, Israel is also a name for Jacob, okay? So it's like a nickname for Jacob. Now, 
Jacob or Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. All right, it's never good when you show favoritism. But because it was the son of his true love, Rachel, the firstborn, he loved him more than any of the others because he was born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. So he makes him this, this robe, this coat, and we know it, it's a coat of many colors. And, and so there's even a play out there, Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat. It's where this comes from. And so he's got this fancy coat. All of his brothers, they're just wearing whatever. And he's got this like, Really cool looking colored coat. Then they, so they know that, that dad loved him more. Verse four says, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any, of, uh, any of, the, of them, they hated him, which we'd all say hate is a strong word. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Verse five, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Like this guy can't win. He's, he's just telling on his brothers. They hate him. He's his father's favorite. They hate him. He gets a fancy coat. They don't have a fancy coat. They hate him. He has a dream, and now they hate him all the more. So Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream. Listen to this dream. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Can't understand why they didn't like him. <laughs> there are some dreams you just need to keep to yourself. So here's the thing. In Genesis, dreams were normally associated with divine revelation. So oftentimes a dream would speak of your destiny. And so for Joseph, these dreams are powerful. This is incredible. God has given me a glimpse into my future. This is so good. Guys, you'll never believe it. You know, God's gonna elevate me up and you're all gonna, you're all gonna bow down and, and worship me. I mean, he gets a picture of the plan that he believes God has for his life. And so his brothers, they don't, they're not a big fan of it. Verse eight, his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then, verse nine, he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. <laughs> There's a theme here to your dreams, Joseph. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So it's easy to see why his brothers hated him, why they didn't think much for him. Now go to verse 12. Verse 12 says, Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, remember, Israel is Jacob, that's his dad. His dad said to him, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. So, mind you, he's been giving his dad a report about his brothers and whether they're working or not working. And so he says, I'm gonna send you to them. Come and bring word back to me. So let me give you a quick picture of what this looked like. So Joseph and his family are in a place called Hebron. And his brothers had, had been grazing flocks near Shechem. This is about a 60 mile journey. So a lot of times we get this idea that they're in like the back pasture. Well, they're not in the back pasture. They have taken their sheep to a place called Shechem. And so Joseph, by orders of his father, is making his way from Hebron to Shechem to find his brothers and check on them. Well, he gets to Shechem, he can't find them. And a man says, I heard they were going to Dothan. So he travels more north to Dothan. And then that's where the rest of the story begins to unfold, which ultimately takes him on a 300 mile journey to Egypt, to Egypt. So let's, let's go into our story back at verse uh, 17 of chapter 37. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Like this is, he's gone from like, we hate you to we, we wanna kill you. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. A cistern is a well. And we'll say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben, remember Reuben was the firstborn. He's the oldest. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. 
Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Now watch this. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, which this is always kind of an interesting detail of the story, they just jumped their brother, threw him into an empty well, and they're like, I'm hungry. You hungry? Let's get something to eat. <laughs> what is going, what's going on? So, so they sit down to eat their meal. They look up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, right? Like, oh, what a moment of sympathy you have here. This is, we can't kill him, he's our brother. So let's sell him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers, his brothers agreed. His brothers agreed. Then verse 31 says, then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. We found this. It looks like our brothers. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. Notice it's not our brother. They're like, see if this is your son's. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Surely Joseph has been torn to pieces. And then in verse 36, we're told that meanwhile, the Midianites, this is, these are the traitors, they sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And then we're gonna skip over Genesis chapter 38, quite frankly, because it, it's kind of a side story that deals with one of the brothers. It's a little bit R-rated, and I'm not gonna tell you more than that because now you're curious and you'll read the Bible for yourself this week. So <laughs> skip 38. We'll pick back up in 30. It's actually more X-rated probably, and now you're even more intrigued. Genesis 39, two more verses, and then we'll unpack what we've, what we've just read. So verse, uh, chapter 39, verse one says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Mind you, this is 300 miles from home. So if you have ever found yourself in a place you never wanted to be, Joseph gets that. If you've ever found yourself slightly off script, Joseph gets gets that. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him, think about that for a moment, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And then verse two, I don't want you to miss this. If you've got your Bibles, underline it. You may want to write these couple words across your notes. The Lord was what? With Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph, so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. The Lord was with Joseph. I don't want you to miss this. The Lord was with Joseph. Did you know that before Jesus was born, an angel said of Jesus, he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think that's an amazing just side note to this story that when Jesus was born, that was the Lord's way of saying, I am with you. The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I say that because if the Lord is with Joseph when he's 300 miles off course, if the birth of Jesus is God's way of saying, I am with you, I want you to know that wherever you are in life, God is with you. You're not alone, you're not alone. Here's what I want you to write down. If you don't get anything else out of this message, write this down. You may be off script, but you are not on your own. You may be off script, but you are not on your own. Another way of saying this is a life off script is not a life all alone. Here's what I know. When we find ourselves in a place we never wanted to be, we feel as if we're the only one. We feel as if we're the only one that's ever dealing with this. Nobody else will understand. We feel like we're on our own. And I can only imagine what was going through Joseph's mind as he was in a place that he never thought he was going to be. I mean, he had this, 
he had this dream, right? My dream, my dream was that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a ruler of some sort. My brothers, my parents, they're gonna bow down to me. God's got purpose on my life. He's got significance on my life. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna have authority. And now I'm owned, I was sold. I am nowhere near my home. I was betrayed by my brothers. My father thinks I'm dead because they lied about me. I was sold as a slave. Like, God, where are you during all of this? Let's just be honest. We've all wondered that at times. God, where are you? I thought if God is in it, it's going to work out. I mean, we all know the saying, God will never give you more than you can handle. Well, hello, seems a little more than Joseph can handle right now. He's a slave. He doesn't even have rights. I, I'm just gonna tell you guys, I don't believe that's a biblical principle. God will never give you more than you can handle. God will never give you more than he can handle. Another way of saying that is God will never put more on you than he has put in you because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So if you find yourself off script and over your head, understand this, you're not alone. You're not alone. God will put you in situations that are beyond you so that you can discover they are not beyond him. And that's what we're about to see. And quite honestly, I think that's where a lot of us have been navigating for the last month of our life. We've been figuring out what does life look like? Things are different. Some, some of you have got tarps on your houses. I was in the home in Burgall last week and they had eight feet of water. And some, I mean, I hear stories of dead fish in homes and you're like, how, how did we get here? And how do we get back on track? And how does all of this? And, and I would say, if we get too focused on how we take our next step, we're gonna miss out on the fact that we are not walking this out alone. I want you to know you may be off script, meaning you may be in a place you never thought you were gonna be, but you're not on your own. You are not all alone. You are not by yourself. You know, maybe for you, it's not even storm related. Maybe for you, maybe you're in a place where you're like, I'm kind of done with the whole storm thing. Like hurry up and take our debris because we kind of want to get back to life. That's the vibe I get from a lot of people. And the truth is we're kind of ready to figure out, like let's get back to living our life. Let's get back to doing what we do. And maybe for you, maybe, the, maybe what's taken you off script wasn't this past month. Maybe if you're being honest, you're like, I've been off script for a long time. It's been a long time ago. Maybe it was when I went off to college. I had an idea of how it was gonna work out. And man, I made a few decisions, found a few friends, and I didn't think I'd ever wind up here. I didn't think I would deal with these kind of challenges. Maybe if we're being honest, we all had this idea of what life is gonna look like we thought it was gonna make us happy, but it's not unfolding the way that we planned. Maybe for you, it's a friendship that came to an end. You had it figured out, you had good people, you confided in them, but all of a sudden, in some turn of events, you may still not know why they turned on you and you feel betrayed. Maybe it was a dream job. If I could just get that job and I get that promotion, man, then it's gonna be, then life's gonna work out, but that dream job turned into a nightmare. This is not what I, what I thought, and... Maybe the diagnosis didn't come back what you were praying for and you found yourself off script. You know, I think back to my wife and I, when we got married, June 6th, 1998, we were promised full-time jobs working at a summer camp and we were excited about it. We weren't gonna make a whole lot of money, but we were, gonna, we, we were stepping into a pretty significant role at this camp. I was gonna run the children's ministry and she was responsible for running 200 acres and like 13 horses. If you know my wife, that's like a dream of hers. We were gonna live in this farmhouse and so everybody was asking us, well, what are you gonna do once you, you know, after you get married and when you're out of school? I was like, oh, it's funny you ask. We've this job lined up and here's how all this is gonna play out. And so we get married and we, we start working for that summer and our full-time job was gonna begin at the end of the summer. We'll come to find out that someone in the organization had been embezzling money and the money that was gonna pay our salaries as newlyweds was gone and so was the job. And I remember everybody saying, well, now what are you gonna do? And we're like, we, that was, <laughs> we only had plan A. There was no plan B and we felt very off script. Very off script. I think back to the very first pregnancy that we had that ended in a miscarriage. And if you've ever been down that road, you know the feelings and the questions and you, you just, you understand how it takes you to a place that you didn't think that you were ever going to be. And that's real, that's real. But here's what you learn. You learn in the midst of these trials that you don't have to go through them alone. Now, I believe one of the biggest lies of the enemy is that nobody's gonna understand and you know you can't trust anybody during this time and you're on your own. I, I think the enemy in life wants to isolate you. I think Satan wants to isolate you to get you to wallow in self-pity. Nobody will understand me. I need you to know something. 
you're not alone. You're not alone. Right now, you are surrounded by people, imperfect people, who have probably walked out something very similar to what you're walking out right now. I think that's why the Bible tells us that we're to comfort one another with the comfort we receive. The reason you've gone through a mess and lived to tell about it is because someone else is about to go through a mess and your story is gonna bring them hope. And here's Joseph all alone in Egypt, 300 miles from home, property. And yet the Lord is with him? You know, it is quite possible that you could be in the middle of a really big mess right now and you're wondering, God, where are you? And God's like, I'm right here, I've never left you, by your side, I'm walking with you. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I love you. I need you to know, regardless of where you are, this church cares about you. That's why it's so important that we find groups to be a part of. That's why it's so important that we experience more of church than just showing up and listening to a sermon and singing some songs. If all you get is the message and the songs, you're getting maybe 20% of who Life Point is. It's about getting into a small group where you're known and you're cared for. It's about being a part of a team where you stand shoulder to shoulder and you change the world together. That's what it's about. And those people know you and those people care about you and they're gonna walk with you. But I want you to know today you're not alone. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. You may be in a place you never thought you were gonna be, but you're not alone. You're not on your own. God is with you. And as we're gonna discover in the weeks to come, if God's with you, you got all that you need. You have all that you need. The Bible puts it like this in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you're, if you're carrying a broken heart today and you're wondering where God is, he's close. He's close. He cares about you. If you feel crushed in spirit, he cares about you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He says, I got you. If you'll come to me, if you'll lean on me, if you'll let me help you through this. Church, we're just beginning a three-week journey, but we're gonna discover some amazing truths about God, and we're gonna learn how do we walk this out when we feel as if we're off script. But I know this much. I know there's a lot of us that are in places right now. Maybe it's through our job. Maybe it's the, the past month. Maybe it's a relational thing that we've ignored for long enough, and it's time we deal with it. But I believe that God is saying, listen, I'm with you and I'm gonna walk this out with you. And I just wanna encourage you to take the next step. I wanna ask you this question. I close almost every message with this question. What is God saying to you? Right now on your heart, what is that thing that the Lord is saying to you? Why did he bring you here today? So for maybe 15 seconds with just music playing, you and God, will you have a conversation? Will you say, God, what are you saying to me right now? And in this moment, just listen. And if you put something on your heart, maybe scribble it on your notes or punch it in your phone, but don't, don't ask God to give you some direction and then ignore it when he does. Take it, write it down, pray on it, and then we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna begin to wrap up. 15 seconds, what's God saying to you right now? As we continue in this mode of prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want you to take a moment. Will you grab hold of whatever it is God's putting on your heart right now? I believe for some, for some it may be marriage related and you're just in the middle of it. And God wants you to know, listen, you're not alone. I'm with you. I'm with you. Let me help you. Let me carry you. Let me comfort you. Maybe right now it has to do with the job. Maybe, maybe your business took a pretty massive hit and it's taken a while to get back on your feet. I know that we at both of our campuses have a team that would love to pray for you. Our care room is available on your way out. If you need directions to our care room, our ushers would be glad to point you in that direction. We'd love to help you and pray for you. There's power in prayer. Maybe today the reason you're here is because you have just been through the ringer. And maybe you're like, you know what? Let's try this church thing one more time. Let's try this God thing one more time. And I want you to know, if that's the reason you're here, I'm honored that you would be here. I want you to know that this church was started for the sole purpose of people finding life in Jesus. And I want you to know the answers to life, they're not found in more things, more relationships with people. They're found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that God loves you so much 
that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to suffer and die on the cross, that it was on the cross that Jesus took on the sins of the world and he conquered sin and death and the grave right there on that cross. His body was buried, but it didn't stay there. He rose again on the third day, proving he's the son of God. And the Bible says that we can have a relationship with God, that we can be restored in our relationship with God. What sin destroyed, Jesus has given us the ability to restore, but it happens when we receive the gift of grace, when we realize what Jesus did, he did for us. And the Bible says if we would declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we would believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. We can be confident in that. And maybe today you came to church and the reason you're here is because God wants a relationship with you. And he's asking you today to repent of your sins. That means ask for forgiveness. Turn to Jesus and to begin that relationship. And if that's you, I wanna give you that opportunity right now, both of our locations with heads bowed. If you're ready to begin a relationship with God, would you make this your prayer? Would you say, dear God, just in the quiet of this moment in your heart, say, dear God, I repent of my sins. I put my faith and my trust in what Jesus Christ did. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for filling me with your Holy Spirit. Now I ask you to give me the strength to live for you. Say this in the quietness of your heart. Say this, say, thank you for saving me. Tell him that, thank you for saving me. Here's what I'd love to do. One more moment, maybe another 20 seconds with heads bowed. If that's you, I wanna give you a second to say, that was me. I joined you in this moment. And here's what we're gonna do across our campuses. When I count to three, if you would say, today I ask Jesus in my life, on the count of three, I want you to throw your hand up high in the air. Join me by raising your hand. And simply raising your hand is gonna be a statement today saying, I ask Jesus in my life. So if that's you, on the count of three, I want you to join me by putting your hand up high. One two, three, right where you are across our campuses, raise your hand saying, today I ask Jesus in my life. That's my decision. Continue to keep it up as I look around here in the center. Absolutely, several hands going up. Man, praise God, I see it. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else today over here to my right? Yes, certainly. One more moment, I don't wanna miss anybody. Anyone else, anyone else? Incredible, both our campuses, let's put our hands down and let's put our hands together today. Let's celebrate today. We've got reason to celebrate, reason to rejoice. Thanks for watching. We hope this message was a blessing to you. And here at LifePoint, we're a church of next steps and we want to help you take yours. So head over to lifepointnow.com where you can join a serve team, you can join a small group, or you can even give online. And make sure you hit our subscribe button. We don't want you to miss any of the content we push to our YouTube channel. Have a great day and we'll see you next time.